So I want to start out today and uh, just kind of go over, because there is a lot of new people here, kind of what the, uh, what the Enterprise Security API is. So I've got this awesome, like totally ridiculous animated PowerPoint slide that explains it way better than I do. And that's the wrong one. <laughs> See, just when you think you're completely prepared. So this is what most web applications look like. You've got all these different layers. You've got all these controls and all these different layers. You've got your authentication. You've got your access control. You've got encryption. You've got logging. You've got validation. You've got output encoding. You've got all these things going on all over your application. The problem is is I wrote the validation routine for the uh, controller and Jason over here wrote the validation routine that validates the same data, the data access layer. Are we doing things the exact same way? Probably not because I'm a better developer than Jason. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, neither one is necessarily absolutely wrong, but in any kind of enterprise application, the key is not who's right and who's wrong. The key is that it's standard. The key is that there's one routine, so if I want to change the data that's being validated, I change it in one place, not 47. Same holds true for any of these controls, right? So this is what your average everyday web application does. What the ASAPI actually is, at its core, this is a library that turns your web application into something that looks a little more manageable. So now you've got this new layer out there, and that's your enterprise security API. In your enterprise security API, this is where you put your validation. This is where you put your output encoding. This is where you put your access control. This is where you put your authentication, uh, logging, anything that's a security concern. I mean, it's the enterprise security API. This is by no means a complete list of all the controls you should have. Uh, but this is just to illustrate, does that look a little more manageable? I think that's much easier from an architect perspective, from a developer perspective, from a manager perspective, to manage, it's easier to change. Um, you know, right now, if you've got a Java EE application, you're probably using Log4J, but is Log4J still gonna be the de facto standard in five years? I don't know. And I would much rather switch out my logging layer right down here at the bottom, rather than try and go into all 1,437,000 classes and change the one line to point to a different import. So that's what the ASAPI is. Um, it's, a, it's a centralized, managed, externalized security service that provides your security controls for you. So with that, now that we've got kind of a high level overview, I want to uh, have Kevin come up here. And what Kevin's gonna do is he's going to make you all cryptography experts. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, maybe that was a little overkill, but uh, Kevin redid the, uh, com he completely retooled the uh, encryption libraries for SAPI 2.0, and he's done some really cool stuff that, uh, while it's well documented, it, we, we get a lot of questions about it, so what I wanted to do was give him a chance to come up and explain what he actually did and what those changes actually mean. Hello, um, my name's Kevin Wall. Um, you probably know me mostly from my 20-page post to the ESAPI users list. Um, uh, Kevin, the other Kevin, has already basically said pretty much everything that's up here. The only major thing that I'd add basically is um, that uh, on the OWASP for ESAPI, so far I'm the only contributor who hasn't actually contributed any code. Personally, I like that way because me and C++ don't get along too much, but um, Basically, uh, the other thing is I occasionally write a blog. Has anybody in here ever read my blog? That's good. <laughs> you haven't wasted your time then. Come on. Okay, um, today basically I wanted to talk about a couple things. Um, essentially, why did we make the changes? What was broke about it? What did we do to fix it? And then um, end with uh, an advanced example of the some of the stuff that's in 2.0. It just goes beyond like the simple encryption stuff. Um, when I started on ESAPI uh, two years ago, a little bit more than two years ago, um, 
the GA version was 1.4, and we were at, I think, 2.0 release Canada 2. Um, and when I first started looking at it for our company, basically, the first thing I noticed was basically the crypto was completely broken. And one of the things that first jumped out at me was basically we were using password-based uh, encryption. That's what PBE stands for. Um, basically, the algorithm we were using was PBE with MD5 and DES. Um, the problem with PBE is that the passwords basically almost always create um, weak keys. Okay, like to get basically, for instance, they, this is encrypts with with DES, uses MD5, runs a hash on MD5 20 times, basically to end up with a DES key. Um, in order to basically get something that would be equivalent to a randomly chosen DES key, 56 bit DES key, you would need something over 20 characters, typically. So most people don't make their keys like master key or whatever that long. So the other problem was basically that um, we picked two different but very weak um, algorithms, DES and MD5. DES is only 56 bits well within brute forcing. There's custom hardware that they made years ago, the Electronic Fun Frontier Foundation funded it, basically broke it within less than 24 hours, brute force. Um, MD5, if you saw the last talk, basically it's now like, what, 21 bits or something. Um, so both of them are weak. In, in a later version of 1.4, we changed this to PBE with SHA-1 and, and DES EDE, which is triple DES. So it's a little bit better, but still not quite great. The other thing is that it uses uh, CBC cipher mode, which I'll mention here in a couple minutes, and you'll see what the problem with that is. Or I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. It, it does use, yeah, it uses CBC and PKC has five padding, but that basically meant that it's uh, prone to basically uh, Oracle padding attacks, which I'll talk later. Um, also, the big problem was that it had a single encryption key. Now, you might not think that's a problem for a lot of you, but like if you wanted to send, uh, you know, encrypted credit card data to MasterCard and some other crypto uh, credit card data to, say, Visa, you would have to use the same encryption key for both of them. That's probably not going to go over well with either one of those credit card companies. So, um, that was a serious problem. Then there's a default setting that, you know, for master key and master salt, which, you know, that's basically like setting default passwords in applications. We don't do that. It's not advised. It's not best practice. And then, lastly, there was no message authenticity. And that basically became important because of the CVC cipher mode and PKCS5 padding. In the 2.0 uh, early releases, um, the default iron was changed to 256-bit de DES, and that was better, but one of the things is with 256-bit DES, is you had to download the um, unlimited strength jurisdiction policy files. That basically meant that, you know, people from outside of the United States, although they wouldn't say that they couldn't do it, they basically weren't technically legally allowed to do it. Um, and so you basically are excluding a lot of people or making their life difficult. Um, the other thing is that this is switched to basically use ECB mode. Um, they basically just used AES by default, which basically uses ECB mode and PKCS5 padding. And there was no way to switch it to use other modes because every other mode requires an initialization vector. Um, it was still in restricted to a single key. It still had default settings for master secret and master salt, but they basically, you could change them, but you had to go through a whole bunch of con contortions to do it, and still no message authenticity. And when I say message authenticity, basically what I'm saying is that there's no way to ensure that the ciphertext basically came from the, um, the sender that you think that it came from. Okay, now let's jump back here. What's wrong with ECB mode? Well, here's the plain text version of the tux image. And here's the encrypted version. See any similarity? Right. The problem with um, the ECB mode is basically patterns that are in the plain text show up as patterns in the cipher text. Ideally, what we want when we encrypt like a plain text multiple times is we want it actually to encrypt to different cipher texts. Okay. So that if I encrypt, you know. Uh, Chris Schmidt that org 
uh, multiple times, right? It encrypts every time I encrypt it, it basically comes up with a different ciphertext. And it's possible to do that when we <clears throat> use other things like um, uh, like CBC and, and random IV. Okay, so the other thing is like, why do we need message authenticity? Well, um, that basically, you know, ensures that the IV and ciphertext is authentic. Well, why is that important? Well, how many of you remember the padding Oracle attack? Good. Um, they basically had an attack like a, there was a, a tool called Poet, right? That basically allowed, like for instance, in ASP.NET, you could basically decrypt the view state and eventually uh, discover the cipher key. Okay, so basically a padding Oracle attack. I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but it was first described way back in 2002 um, in the context of IPsec by Serge uh, Wanaday. And it's an attack on CBC mode where you have an Oracle, and the Oracle basically is whether the padding is correct or not, typically. Um, and that's either leaked out by a, a, maybe a different exception message, or it could be done via timing attacks and stuff like that. Um, um, so basically, what's the big deal about it? Well, the problem is that the, uh, an adversary can basically go through and allows them to decrypt stuff without knowledge of the secret key, and it works. It's very efficient. I mean, it's like, you know, um, I think that the demo that they had with Poet basically um, was compressed a little bit, but I mean, I've basically seen it like work within 20 minutes, where it would actually crack the view state, and that was just like on an ordinary, you know, laptop. Um, I'm going to, uh, you know, if you want more details, and I would actually really recommend reading this. It basically explains it very well. Um, but Brian Holofield's OWASP presentation on his blog um, basically describes how the padding attack actually works. Okay, um, major changes. Well, first thing we did is we there was um, a lot of methods that we deprecated and, and a few even that we removed. Um, that were just considered basically too too unsafe. The ones that are deprecated, we actually change their behavior so that technically they're not really um, compatible with the old version. Um, but they're there. So this basically, if you didn't, if you hadn't persisted any of your data, you at least would be able to live a little bit with flipping it in the new version and without changing your code immediately. Um, we put in support for ciphertext. Um, objects instead of like, just basically returning strings because when you encrypt, that's basically what you get back is the ciphertext. And then that ciphertext allows you to serialize things so that you can put it out or you can get different aspects of the cipher. And now the ciphertext basically contains not only the actual raw ciphertext, but it contains basically, it carries around with it the initialization vector, it carries around with it the cipher algorithm or cipher transformation that it was used. So it has basically everything that the other end needs to decrypt it. Um, we added also a plain text object, and partly that was for sym symmetry, but also it was mostly for being, because strings are not the only thing that people encrypt, right? I mean, you may want to encrypt images, you may want to encrypt um, some other kind of binary data. This basically does the transformation to make sure that like it always uses UTF-8 encoding, because if you don't, and you do that across like different operating systems, something like, like Spark, running Solaris and Windows on a you know, 8086, basically it won't work because of the different encoding types that are native to the platforms. Um, we added support for multiple secret keys. You can specify now when you encrypt and decrypt a specific secret key. We added the support for message authenticity to get rid of basically the possibility of the Oracle padding or the padding Oracle attacks. Um, there's support in there for multiple cipher, I shouldn't say modes, but it should say basically cipher algorithms. So you can basically switch between them. The problem is right now it's not a thread safe mechanism. I mostly added that because I needed a way to be able to easily do the unit tests, the test, make sure that it worked with different algorithms. Um, so I wouldn't really advise doing that unless you're like putting explicit locks around your stuff. Um, that we'll make that thread safe in the 2.1 stuff. But it, the part of the problem is that, you know, the only other way that I would have to do it is basically to change the properties, you know, on the fly or something. Um, and then we also changed the basically 
to use a strong default. So we, the default that we picked was picked, first of all, with the intent that basically that we could use it out of the box and it would still be strong. And that meant basically you didn't have to download the, um, the AES, you know, the unlimited strength jurisdiction policy. So we use AES, CBC, PKCS5 padding, 128-bit key instead of a 256-bit key, and a random initialization vector. And it turns out actually that in some regards there's some like related key attacks that in some ways actually make um, 256-bit keys um, a little bit more insecure in certain sort of circumstances. Um, the authenticity basically we use an HMAC SHA-1. Basically this is like a double application of, of the SHA-1 algorithm. So it's basically HMAC SHA-1 is still considered safe. SHA-1 by itself is not. back in a forward page and a back page. <laughs> He's good at crypto. He's still learning how to use computers. So. I don't use apples. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a poor man. I can't afford apples. <clears throat> okay, um, this is basically the exa advanced example. How many of you are on Google Plus? Okay, a few of you. So you've seen like these, basically these advertisements, these notifications that they send out that you get sometimes in an email from other people. And don't worry, this is not my real one. So, you, you know, if you want if you want an invitation from me, I still have all 150 of them left. So just send me an email. I'll be glad to send them to you. But um, presumably, Google's using some kind of a cryptographic token here, although they could be just using an object reference into a database. But it looks more like a cryptographic token. And the problem with putting it in a database is then when it expires in 30 days or whatever, they're going to have to clean out the database. The cryptographic token, you can just build it so that it has an automatic ex expiration. Um, so as a related kind of to that, what would you, if you, know, if you wanted to implement, if you wanted to implement um, something similar, but like for a coupon service that you could email, you know, how would you do that? Well, you could do it if you had the crypt uh, appropriate cryptographic token. With ESAPI, you know, basically, well, with anything, you basically you would want to put like the authenticated user's name, a uh, target of, of your friend you're going to send it to, a merchandise ID to recognize what they're trying to buy, or what the coupons for, the uh, coupon value, expiration date, et cetera. So basically, all things. If we wanted basically to protect, to make the identities confidential, we make the token unforgeable, secure from tampering, immune to re replay attacks, or at least have the ability to make it immune to replays. Well, if you were doing that, it might, if you had to write all that from scratch, it would take a considerable amount of code. Um, with ESAPI, you got basically two pieces. One that basically creates the token, the other one that validates the token. The creation of the token is essentially this little bit of code. And I'm not, you know, these notes are going to be um, posted. I'm not going to, like, read through every line. Um, the one thing that I would point out that you can crypto token, the constructor will also take a secret key if you want to use something other than the master key. Um, and personally, I would recommend not using just the master key for every, pur pur every purpose. It's not a good practice. Um, but basically, if you're going to do this, you'd have to store a knot somewhere to prevent replays if you wanted to do that. And then consuming the token, those are basically your steps. And you have some you know, business logic steps in there that I left out. Um, but basically, that's all there is to it. So, so I'm your third speaker. I changed clothes real quick, so it would be uh, new and interesting. That's an awesome sound. So I started doing my presentations in Prezi lately. Does anybody use Prezi? This is like the most awesome thing I've ever seen in my entire life. So now we get to the fun stuff. So we're going to talk about what, uh, what is in the future for a SAPI. So uh, the title of this talk was Defense Against the Dark Arts. That's my code name for a SAPI. Uh, it's a little bit fun. I actually thought about dressing up like Professor Snape for this talk, but I couldn't secure a costume this close to Halloween. Plus, I just I, I don't look that good in Professor Snape costume. So for those who haven't seen it, this is the brand new, fresh logo for a sappy so you're going to start seeing this all over the place um, it's going to be on all the books that uh, you know you guys are all going to publish about this after this talk so 
So in ASAPI 2.0, we made a bunch of various improvements. Kevin talked about the crypto. Um, some of the other improvements we made, we made it a lot simpler for developers to implement uh, what the controls were, and that's an ongoing process. So it's only going to get easier and easier as we go. We also added better end user support options. So we have uh, a chat channel now. Um, we're, at, we're in the process of bringing up some forums. Um, so it's easier for you guys to get on there and bug me and ask me how in the hell do I do this thing that I'm trying to do. And generally, I'll answer you. We also heavily, heavily, heavily increased our test coverage. Um, this was a, a big problem in SAPI 1.4. We had about 23% test coverage of over all our code, which uh, for a security library, that's not really something to brag about. So we're currently up to uh, in the 80s somewhere of, of uh, as far as our test coverage goes. So it's uh, significantly better. And uh, you know, as, as we continue coding, we'll uh, hopefully someday reach 100%. So now I want to talk about the roadmap. So for those that aren't aware, on Tuesday we held a, uh, a summit for a SAPI. So we got a bunch of people together, locked everybody into a room for eight hours, and said, OK, what do we want to do with this project? It's time to uh, figure out what the next steps are going to be trying to figure out what a SAPI 2.1 means. There's a lot of big buzzwords flying around all over the place, so let's, uh, let's put it into perspective. And so this is basically what we came up with. The first big thing is we need to redefine what the manifesto is of, of a SAPI. I mean, we, you know, a SAPI started out by Jeff Williams five years ago, and he had a very, very clear, concise idea of what he wanted it to be, and a lot's changed in the last five years and there's new needs. So it's one of the big things we're doing is we're going to take the time to really redefine what the library is, um, what it needs to be, where the holes are that it needs to fill. So in part of doing that, the first thing we need to do is we're going to redefine the project vision and the charter. Right. So that's the high level stuff that I was just talking about. What, what is this library actually? Next thing we're going to do, so how many people here have done threat models? I assume at least four of you have. So threat models aren't fun, but they're necessary in most cases. Um, a security library absolutely needs to know what the threats are for the controls that we're trying to provide. So we're going to do some threat models, and we're going to make those available as part of the SAPI project. Um, generally, they're going to be documentation. We're going to define the architecture more clearly. Um, right now, one of the one of the major problems with the SAPI, at least for Java, is that uh, the architecture is just not really well defined. Uh, you can't get a really good overview look of it and say, oh, I totally get what you're saying there. You know, you have to email me and then I'll tell you. And then, and then you say, oh, I totally get what you're saying. And last but not least, we're going to create the user story. How do we actually intend for people to use this? Um, you know, how are people going to use this? How are people going to abuse this? So that's going to be really important as we go forward in, in some of these other things I'm going to talk about. The next thing we're doing, and this is a big, 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 big thing, is componentization. And uh, anybody who's currently using, how many people actually are currently using a SAPI or have used a SAPI? So a few of you. So good, I, I get to corrupt a whole bunch of new guys. It's great. So componentization is one of the biggest problems with a SAPI 2.0, and I know it's holding a lot of people back. Right now, when you pull down a SAPI for Java, you pull down um, basically the entire Maven repository of dependencies, which for any large enterprise, that's obviously a problem. So one of the big things we're doing with 2.1 is we're going to separate the API out and uh, make it so that you know I can, I can get the ASAPI without downloading all the dependencies, and then I can get the pieces that I need. So when I talk about components, what I'm talking about is the individual controls within the ASAPI. We're going to implement the components that controls themselves in a pluggable architecture. So I'll be able to just plug in the piece that I want, and that's what I get to use. We're going to create controls that can also stand on their own, though. So if you, if you have cases where you don't want to use the ASAPI, but you want to use the ASAPI encoders, well, by all means, you can do that. And last but not least, we're going to create behavioral tests. In addition to the unit tests we have, we're going to create behavioral tests to, to exercise controls. So my authenticator is not going to work in your application. I think that's pretty obvious. So what we can do, rather than saying, I'm going to solve your problem, is we can create 
a set of behavioral tests that ensure that your authenticator acts as it should be acting. And we can provide that as part of the API. Documentation. So this has been a huge complaint with the project, and understandably so. Um, I, I myself am a, a developer. I like writing code. I hate writing words. Uh, so this is something that we're, we're actively reaching out to the community for, and we're reaching out to uh, have people help us do this because it's, we know it's important, but I'd rather not write documentation because I'm not good at it. So we've come up with this idea of organic and community-driven documentation. This is where you get to tell us how you use the SAPI, and you get to help people. This is going to have a bunch of components to it, and it's going to be part of the SAPI community, which I'll talk about in a little while. So the first big one is integration guides. How helpful is an integration guide? It's probably the most valuable document I've ever used for any library. How do I make this thing work in my Spring MVC application? I mean, that's, it really doesn't get much more descriptive than that. Question and answer, questions and answers. So this is another, like a, a visualized uh, stack exchange. So we want that for a SAPI, right? So, uh, you know, Kevin comes up and says, hey, how do I do this thing? And, you know, Jason answers and he says, oh, you do it this way. And then you guys all get to comment on them and tell them, you know, thumbs up, thumb down, you're wrong, you're dumb, you're smart, whatever. Um, obviously, there'll probably be some moderation there. Adoption story. So this is another one. How many people, so just a real quick show of hands, how many people are security professionals that develop or that don't develop? Okay, and how many of you are developers that either do or don't do security? Well, that's pretty 50-50 even split. That's pretty impressive. So adoption stories. As a developer, I've been in the position where I've had to sit in front of my manager and say, I want to use this thing. And he goes, cool, why? What, what, what do we get from it? And that's a hard question to answer as a developer, right? Because you've got a lot of really good reasons why, but how do you explain that to somebody who's not a developer? It's like, oh, because it's cool and it makes me, it lets me do things and do less work. Well, that's great, but you know what? My manager doesn't care that I'm doing less work because he's just going to give me more. So the second side of this is refining the community driven. Once again, community driven is a big key here because this documentation is not for me. I know how to use my library. This documentation is for you guys. So we're, we reached out to the community and a lot of this came from the Asafi Summit. So one of the biggies that came up is it would be really great if there was some how-to video tutorials or just tutorials in general, right? So you're a developer and you have a PCI scan done and your uh, auditor walks up or your manager walks up and hands you a report. The first thing on the report is you have XSS. Every, sing every single PCI report starts with you have XSS. <laughs> now most developers are going to say, that's great. When the hell's XSS? Okay, so I get on Google and I say, what in the hell is XSS? And uh, you know, I find OWASP's site because OWASP is obviously the only place to go to find out what XSS is. Now, that's great. How do I fix it? Well, that is absolutely the most loaded question that nobody ever answers ever, right? How do you fix the vulnerabilities that you see on your report that you get from the scanning tool? So what was recommended is it would be really great if we could have a series of videos that said, presented that exact scenario. I'm a developer, I get a report. Here's the vulnerability that I need to fix. What are the steps that I need to take? How do I fix it with a SAPI? So we're gonna do a whole series of how-to videos and tutorials to go along with those. Um, for those of you that don't like YouTube, because uh, they still exist somewhere. So we're gonna be doing that. Next is cheat sheets. So the cheat sheet series for OWASP has been Hugely, hugely popular. Everybody loves them. It's like a quick reference guide, right? So we're going to be doing cheat sheets along the same lines. How do I fix XSS in my insert thing here? Um, what are the recommended ways to resolve session management issues? So we're going to develop a whole series of cheat sheets around each individual control. Quick start guide. So this is like, you know, when you buy the router at the store and you take it home and it's got a book and it's got a card, do you read the book or do you read the card? <laughs> Neither. Well, yeah, there you go. I, I have, I have a, an acronym for you. It's RTFM. 
Um, no, but the, the, the point here is, is that people don't like words. I don't like writing words. People don't like to read a lot of words unless it's like a really great story, right? Well, you know, I could probably write some pretty cool stories, but it would make more sense for me to just give you a quick reference guide, a quick start. I need to put this in and see if it's going to work for me. How do I make it work quickly? So we're going to be developing a quick start guide, which will be published. So this will come in hard copy if you order it or PDF. So it's something that you can bring into your organization and develop or distribute to your developers or to your security guys or to whoever. And then publish documentation. So I have personally been working on a book for a SAPI for the last three years that I really just need to buckle down and finish. Um, and my hope is that around the same time that 2.1 comes out, I'll be finishing that up. I know there's a couple other uh, SAPI publications in the works as well. So there will be a lot of uh, documentation. I think that's what I'm getting at. Plus, I've got a really cool tree graphic. That's cool stuff, right? So looking forward, so those are the big changes for 2.1. Now, obviously, we've got a lot of things that we want to do. And unless we want to wait for 10 years for 2.1 to come out, we're not going to get them all in. So looking forward, some of the other big things that we've got coming up is we're going to write up a full technical specification uh, based on some work that uh, some, the, uh, the ISO is working on, um, which is ironically based off of a SAPI. And we're going to base our work off of his work. So it's kind of like a circular, weird standards thing, but uh, we're going to do up a whole technical specification for the entire API. And the, the goal here is that I can hand you a specification and say, I need you to write me an output encoder. And you understand what I mean when I say that. Um, we're going to rethink all of the various controls. We're going to analyze the scope. Um, that includes things like, hey, what about a SAPI for iPhone? What about a SAPI for Android. What about a SAPI for my AS400 that lives in the closet? Um, yes, they're still out there. Uh, so, you know, there's there's a different scope now than there was five years ago, and so this this will partly be reflected in 2.1, but this is a, a, a much larger, grander vision um, where you'll be able to use a SAPI on any platform, um, on any operating system, on any language. That's what we're working towards. We're going to completely redefine error handling. Right now, all the error handling is based off of Java, um, which is great if you're writing in Java. But if you happen to be writing in anything other than Java, there's only like 47 other languages you can write a web app in. And not all of them support exception throwing. So we're going to rethink the, the error handling model. Error handling is something that's very important in a security app, as I'm sure all of you know. So we want to make sure that we come up with something that's portable that can be used across all the various implementations of a SAPI. The other big one is the enterprise security configuration. So this is something that I've actually been thinking about for going on two years now about how to, how to solve. So uh, right now, I've got my SAPI, and that SAPI has a configuration. And generally speaking, that configuration is going to be, depending on what language that configuration is going to be, either a properties file or an XML file. Well, that's all fine and dandy, but I've got an enterprise application portfolio. I've got 50 apps. I've got things that I'm going to want that's common between all 50 of those apps. And then I've got things that are going to be specific to a group of apps. And then I've got things that are going to be specific to an app. And I may even have things that are specific to a logged in user. So the, the idea here is to create a portable enterprise security configuration that could be both centrally managed and can also uh, be overridden. Right, so you can have a, you can imagine a world where you've got that exact scenario. It's not that far to stretch. So, and I, I think that's a pretty important thing. So, um, I, I've I've worked out some models on how to do that. Um, now it's just a matter of you know telling people to do it. So that's the roadmap. Uh, now it's not illustrated here in the slide, but one of the biggest changes that's coming to a SAPI actually has absolutely nothing to do with code. And that is that uh, we are merging all of the ASAPI projects into one project called ASAPI. And we are going to release implementations of that project as sub-projects. So it'll be a lot more like the log4j model. 
Um, right now, if you look for a sappy, it's like, are you talk about a sappy? Uh, the question I always get when I talk about a sappy is, well, which one are you talking about? Well, what do you mean? There's only one. No, are you talking about Java or PHP or .NET or ActionScript or Ruby or Grails or Groovy or whatever? I mean, the list goes on and on. So that's the big change coming up to a sappy, and we're going to be doing some stuff uh, working with SourceForge on that. So I've got one minute, so I'm going to fly through this really quickly. Uh, the ASAPI community is the latest, greatest thing that's coming up, right? So starting at the beginning of next year, we're going to have something very similar to the jQuery community. We're going to have user-contributed components like plugins, user-contributed documentation, forums, live chat, articles and tutorials. And we're done. So thank you, thank you everybody. I want to I want to hand this off to uh, Jason Lee. So I work with him on the the Global Projects Committee. We've got some really cool stuff coming up. Uh, as if anybody has any questions about Asapi, I will be in the room right next door, right after this, in the open source showcase. Well, well, yeah, over there. Sorry, uh, I'll be in the the same room where the CTF is. So please definitely come find me. Ask me. I'll be around. Yeah, sure. Probably be good. Uh, so first of all, I want to thank uh, Chris and Kevin for giving me some of their time from uh, their presentation. So uh, you guys have probably don't even know this because we didn't announce it very well, but uh, this whole OWASP track thing is kind of new for OWASP. Um, uh, we've had lots and lots of conferences, and we have lots and lots of projects. Uh, and we haven't really done a good job of actually presenting our own projects at OWASP conferences. So this is kind of a new initiative. And rather than steal an entire presentation slot to talk about OWASP projects in general, I'm just stealing Chris's time. So, <laughs> so uh, the whole idea about this was that we were going to launch an OWASP projects portal uh, at AppSec USA. You can tell by the red script that uh, this is not exactly going to happen, uh, but I'll talk about that later. So. Um, just a little bit about OWASP projects. Uh, there, you may have noticed there's an open source showcase going on next door behind us. Uh, and that's all, OWASP, you know, all open source projects in general, but we want to highlight OWASP projects in general. So um, what are OWASP projects? That's probably the biggest question I've received at the showcase. Uh, and it's really easy. OWASP projects are open source and they're free. That's the bottom line for OWASP projects. Um, anyone can start a project, anyone can contribute. And anyone can use them. So it's uh, an open source community, um, and it's fairly popular. Uh, we've got documentation projects, tool projects, and code projects. So uh, how many people have actually, you know anything about an OWASP project? Raise your hand. Uh, it's almost the entire room, and I assert that anybody who did not raise their hand is lying, because I know you all just sat through Chris's talk. So you know something about OWASP projects. Uh, so <laughs> Uh, so the thing is, OWASP projects have been pretty successful. We have over 140, um, over 140 projects in various degrees of maturity. Uh, so what exactly is the problem? The problem is we have over 140 projects. Uh, how many people have tried to find an OWASP project? Right, so uh, I yeah, wanted to actually... <laughs> yeah, exactly, so I wanted to paste the wiki page of OWASP projects up here. I zoomed out to about a minus a thousand percent, still couldn't fit it on the slide. So uh, this is the best I could do. Uh, see if you can find the project you're looking for. Did you find it? No, I didn't think so. So uh, that's a problem that we wanted to solve with the OWASP projects portal. Uh, we, wanted to find, we wanted to provide a way for consumers to actually find projects. Uh, we wanted to provide a way for our community to provide feedback for projects. Uh, and for our contributors to actually get recognized for their projects. Um, and of course, you know, we at the Global Projects Committee kind of had a little bit of a selfish, uh, non-altruistic part of it, and that's the fact that we want to be able to manage and sort through the project. So it's not all, it's all, all you know, warm and fuzzy. There, there's some selfishness to it. Uh, but this is really the point, uh, the vision of the OS Projects Portal. Uh, so what did we do, or what are we going to do? Uh, well, we partnered with SourceWord. Uh, we have a contract with them 
Uh, GeekNet is the, are the people behind SourceForge, and they are providing us an OWASP neighborhood to house all the metadata that we can accumulate about OWASP projects. So soon will come the day when you can actually, uh, when our project leaders will start tagging their own projects and you'll be able to search by, all right, well, I'm a developer and I need something related to Java or I need something related to authentication or I need something related to uh, crypto or whatever, uh, and we'll be able to sort through that. Uh, and why do we actually want that? Well. How many people are familiar with SourceWord? Just about everybody. So you guys probably recognize this kind of summary page that just every, every project kind of has on SourceWord. So if we go back to our goals, that summary page is awesome because it provides a consistent look and feel to all the projects. So it's easy to find the details that you're looking for. We get our feedback from the awesome community reviews. And hopefully one day we'll have kind of like a five-star system that Amazon does. Uh, there's tons and tons of plugins that are available, and we want to actually, this is actually kind of important for our project leaders. Uh, I know not many of them are in the room, but uh, we want to actually enable for our project leaders to do whatever they want. So uh, whether it's uh, using the SourceForge in infrastructure, whether it's using their, uh, their own infrastructure, what have you, uh, we want them to be able to use this portal. So um, there's lots and lots of options to support that. And the last part, again, that selfish thing, we want to be able to organize and gather me metadata about, uh, about our own projects so we can make it easier for you all to download and find and uh, actually use and promote the projects. Uh, so just a little background about why we want to have all that metadata and drive that forward. Um, of the 140 projects, which ones are the best ones? Can anyone give me an answer? And I dare you. Sappy, sappy. Yeah, I figured that would be the case since we're in the Asapi room. So the answer is that we don't really have a good way of helping you guys out as project consumers. What's a good project? What's not a good project? What's still developing? What's mature? What's awesome? So uh, we're, we're moving forward with this whole idea of having incubator, labs, and flagships. So how many people are familiar with the idea of incubator projects? Everyone kind of has a sense of what it means. And so hopefully, just by those terms alone, you kind of are able to identify what projects are important, uh, which ones are. And the whole idea behind having a projects portal is that whole process is going to be community driven. So uh, OWASP, is the, the big thing about OWASP is that it's open, right? Um, we want to be inclusive, uh, we want to have uh, participation, and the way we want to do that is providing feedback to the project leaders, to the consumers, uh, that will drive this entire process. So um, we're going to use an open review system for going through this elevation project process, we're going to use it for benefits to project leaders, and we're going to use it to promote visibility so you guys can find the projects that you want. Uh, so what was our timeline? Well, uh, I, I was really, really aggressive. I thought, you know, okay, uh, the GPC is going to gather uh, three days before the conference, and we're just going to move all 144 projects uh, over from the wiki to the source storage portal. Yeah, well, uh, that doesn't really turn out so well. It's a little bit harder to migrate 140 some odd projects than I thought. So, my bad, but that's okay. We're, this, is, this is what we're going to do now. Uh, we've got a timeline. We're get, we've got five projects out there, and if there are any project leaders in the room that want to volunteer their project, um, would, I will happily take down your name. Uh, and we're going to just migrate them slowly. Uh, and by the new year, we're actually going to have all the, at least all the metadata from our projects migrated to the source for it. So you guys can start searching on that metadata. Uh, we'll have the first projects that have volunteered today uh, over on that portal and by next year uh, I'm going to assert that all new projects will be available on the project uh, portal and anybody will be able to search on those things. So um, this is the kind of map of uh, what I hope will become a far easier way for you guys uh, to find the projects that you're looking for. Awesome. So that's really, if you have any questions at all, uh, feel free to email the Global Projects Committee at projects at OAuth.org.